just to begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri, Ngunnawal, Gundungurra, Niampa and Burupai peoples of Australia who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located and with whom CSU has association. And I pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I'd like to um, thank all of you for uh, attending today's uh, third session in our Scholarship in Online Learning Open Professional Learning series. Uh, we've, we've explored what is open in our second session. We explored what it was for an academic or professional person working in higher education to become open and um, adopt open practices. And I think it makes sense for us to have our third and final session focusing on an exploration of a range of different stakeholders' views of what is open um, within the, um, in terms of open education practice in higher education. So uh, we're fortunate enough today to have six people um, on our panel representing a range of views on open educational practice in higher education. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Valerie Peachy, who's a professor of open education and co-director of Your Imagine. Um, Karen Johnson, our Executive Director of the Division of Library Services. Chris Orchard, who's a course Director of Communication and Creative Industries. Dr. Carolyn Robinson, who's an Associate Professor and the Discipline Lead in Podiatry and also Associate Head of School of Community Health. We have Melinda Lewis, who's a lecturer in the Graduate Learning Outcome Courses and Resources Lead in Indigenous Cultural Competency, and Dr. Philip Ace, Associate Professor and Director of Learning Technologies Unit in the Division of Learning and Teaching. So the format that we're going to be um, using today, uh, we have three key questions and our panellists have been given those um, three key questions <laughs> before we started uh, so that they were feeling relatively prepped to um, tackle each of these questions. We're going to, we're going to uh, spend about 15 minutes exploring each question and then open up for general discussion at the end. We did, like all of our scholarship in online learning um, sessions, we always use some kind of um, reading as a prompt to help start to, start to get people's ideas um, uh, getting people thinking, engaging with a particular reading so that people are coming with a particular, you know, uh, viewpoint that they can also be referring to and um, also encouraging um, participants to be involved in that discussion and provide them with some information that's going to help inform that discussion. Um, for those of you that may not have had a chance to uh, read that, that's okay, but there's a URL here on the screen. It's a tiny URL. If you want to go to that URL, URL right now, you'll be able to download a copy of the article. And I think we've got one of the authors of this article, Adrian. I'm just checking if Adrian's managed to, yes, hi, Adrian. Adrian's managed to um, attend this session today, which is great. And um, we welcome you, Adrian, to the CSU community and look forward to um, having you engaged in the conversation as well. Uh, could I ask during the um, uh, each about the exploration of each of our questions, if people could just keep their um, audio on mute, unless of course um, we open up the floor for for um, discussion. Please use the chat. Um, we can populate the chat with questions and comments, and then throughout the session, I'll be referring to the chat and drawing upon that to uh, encourage our panellists to respond to some of the ideas that are coming from the floor. So let's get started. Um, the first question, in an ideal world, what would a university that has embraced open look like from your perspective? So Val, can I ask you to respond to that first, please? Sure, I just had to get off mute. Well, it, you know, it's really interesting because I'm bringing um, a Canadian lens 
and an Australian lens to the question. In addition to um, the article, Adrian, that you and Karina worked on. And I guess from my experience, I did work for what was an open university. And in my view, there were no barriers. It's not only my view, it was the, the university's practice, I guess. There were no barriers to entry. There was no, um, they didn't have to meet any particular competency to get in. What they had to do was demonstrate competency to get out in whatever subject or degree that they took. Um, there was an enormous amount of flexibility in uh, scheduling uh, when they wrote their exams. Now, there were policies to support all this. So if you decided to take a course, you wrote your exam first and you failed, well, you failed the course. So that wasn't such a smart thing to do, but students did have that choice. They could enroll 365 days a year. They could start 365 days a year. So to me, that was a really, um, that is a, you know, a university model that does embrace open in a very broad sense of the word. Um, there were also in place, and this came out in the article too, the political levers of policy. And there were policies in place that supported that framework. So I'll just, um, I'll stop there to give other participants a chance, but that's my perspective and how I would really see open. Great, thanks Val. Um, Karen, would you like to share your thoughts on, on this question? Well, look, I'll come in from the perspective of collection resources, which, you know, uh, constitute a really large part of our budget and most library budgets when you think about it these days. And an uh, uh, ideal open approach would be that knowledge that is actually being funded mostly by the public purse through research in universities or written by academics is actually freely available to students so that there's, there is free access. Um, I have to say that I've been spending a lot of time investigating what they're doing in the United States with their open textbook movements which are actually an attempt to reduce student costs. And there's also been quite a bit of an effort in Australia with Western Sydney's approach to, you know, funding textbooks for students so that they don't have to actually buy them. And there have been various press initiatives like at the ANU and now at La Trobe. So in, a, in an ideal world, open for me would be uh, knowledge being fair and accessible, uh, reusable and available to students at no additional cost. And given how much they're paying in hex fees these days, it's probably would be ideal if they didn't have to also spend in the United States $1,200 a year on textbooks. And I'm not quite sure what the Australian amount is, but anyway, it can be quite high and quite a high financial burden for students who are already struggling, um, potentially part-time trying to work, all the other costs, and then having to um, absorb those as well. So I suppose that's my definition of what open could look like in an ideal world, free access to content. Great. Thanks for that, Karen. I'm sure that will generate some discussion later on. <laughs> okay, I'd like to now, um, uh, Chris, would you like to comment on that question, How what you think a university would look like that's embraced open? I found that a really challenging question, to be asked. I mean, I spend most of my time trying to figure out how I can push policy to its limits rather than imagine what's beyond policy in some senses. So uh, it was a difficult question for me to think about what what it might look like. In, in a kind of in our kind of current context from a course design and review perspective, I suppose um, a university like that looks like something that is really embedded in kind of social cohesion and social values and accessibility. So for mine, it was about thinking about the ways in which policy settings at a, at a federal and in some instances at a state level need to be reset so that accessibility to information and accessibility to courses in that sense um, is opened up to people who previously don't have access. So 
Um, for me, the policy aspects of the paper and the pre-reading were, um, were key highlights of that as well. Yeah, so there are, there's some significant tensions there. Um, uh, okay, um, Caroline, would you like to share your views? Mm, thank you. Um, okay, I took a very pragmatic view, I think, from a school perspective and bearing in mind the, um, the detail in the paper that said open must, for it to be accepted, you know, nationally, open must actually concord with something that we that we practice at the minute in terms of the um, economic sort of rationalist model of education and if it looks too different it's not going to be accepted so I, I thought well what do we have at the minute and the thing that struck me most uh, that that keeps us away from being open is the relative rigidity of our infrastructure and I think for me it was about just looking at something like our academic year, which which is a really historic sort of odd situation that we've got in universities. We work people to exhaustion in sort of 12-week sessions and then we we have this arbitrary sort of assessment time and then we start all over again and we work people to exhaustion. And it doesn't allow space for creativity. I think we lose a lot of time in the academic year because people are so busy um, doing teaching and assessment and all the potential opportunity for creativity is sort of squeezed out of a lot of the year. So when I was thinking about open, it was trying to address what we have in terms of a, a timeline and trying to build flexibility in. And I started mapping out, uh, sketching out a, a sort of an option in a session that was still 14 weeks long, but it had four weeks on and one week off and four weeks on and one week off and four weeks on so that you actually built in some breathing time almost for students and academics and other staff into our session because it doesn't work the way we have it at the minute. Um, it doesn't allow us to be creative and thinking about how we, you know, how we actually move towards open. And my analogy this morning, I had to go shopping to show you this. If you have, this is our, this is our semester, all right? This is our academic year. It's a solid block. It's rigid. We can't do a lot with it, all right? It's, it's overwhelming. If you ate all that, you're going to feel ill and you're going, oh, my gosh, I can't. I'm not going to face that again. Versus these little these like little bites, they're in reverse, aren't they? All right? If you put things in bite-sized chunks, put our academic year into bite-sized chunks, make our subjects into bite-sized units, I think that that's how we could move towards open. Thank you. <laughs> Great, and um, thanks for introducing chocolate just, just <laughs> right on lunchtime. Um, okay, so I'll I'll hand over to Min now. Min, do, would you like to share your views, and then I'll and then I'll bring Philip in. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, everybody. <clears throat> I think I look at this through the lens that open is a very social process. So, in looking at that social process, there there are many social networks and social actors and participants in that network. So particularly I would like to have um, a focus and a, and a vision that would really look at the different knowledge systems that everybody um, that we're working with actually offer and bring to the table and present, um, moving away from just Western notions of knowledge and how that actually can be represented in a range of different means. Um, so broadening that thinking and that's those practices around knowledge systems and the representation. And secondly, including those very transdisciplinary and collaborative partnerships into what the open social networks actually are, and then thinking in what ways they can be better represented through, for example, our delivery models. So it's not just the university is delivering to, to the world, but what actually, who is the university? You know, who, who and how do we make up that space? And what is in that big social network that we can be really working with, acknowledging, collaborating? Great, thanks, Min. Uh, Philip, I'd like to hand over to you now. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, Philip, there we go. Well, well there we go. Yeah, yeah, just when I clicked, it went in restoring mode. Uh, just to emphasize the technology angle. I'm um, not controlling that, Philip. You did that yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I've got a few uh, notes from different angles. Um, I think that the first thing I would assume in such a university, an open university, is that the availability of learning and teaching resources can be taken more or less for granted. And academics are using teaching time for active learning and teaching. The other thing uh, that happens in course design and subject design processes is that OERs, uh, open education resources, are being used by default. That's where you start. You don't start with, I've got to create it from scratch. In, in a world like that, the role of educational designers and faculty librarians might be converging as, as they, they work and support academics. There would be lots of free short courses for lifelong and life-wide learning. Um, there'll be lots of free learning resources published as a matter of course on YouTube and all other places. Uh, it's just part of the ethos of the university to, to make things available. Uh, it'll probably have disaggregated services, some folks paying for assessment, others for support. There'll be modular courses and subjects, the chocolate model. Um, then prior learning and experience will be recognized, so there's freer movement among institutions. Um, badging, those kind of things is just common practice. And that the technologies we use are open from beginning to end. So we are really drawing on open source software um, and the technologies require no login, uh, except when, when people sign up for a formal bit, one of those chunks. That's, that's my vision. Okay, so I can see from each of the panellists' response to that question that a number of challenges have been raised um, in terms of higher education infrastructure, in terms of resourcing, in terms of funding, and I can now see that one hour was not long enough for this panel session. <laughs> Uh, because I think this is, this is going to certainly, this will be great because it's going to launch into further debate for us to explore in future sessions with our We Imagine Open Season. Could I encourage um, audience participants at this point in time to please, um, if you've got any comments or any questions that you would like to have recorded in the chat, please do so. We will visit some of those later, but I am mindful of time. Uh, but it would be nice to have, even if some, some big questions, some hairy questions, some challenging questions, please make sure we get those populated in the chat because we may be able to then um, build upon those in future sessions in November that, that uh, we will be running for the We Imagine Open season. Uh, thank you to the panellists for responding to that question because uh, there was a lot of breadth and I think that was great that um, the panel is actually um, providing us with a range of perspectives, but there were some simil similar um, comments uh, and views shared there as well.